We've been going through a, yep, we've been going through a series on John, and the last two weeks, we were in Samaria. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the lady, the woman at the well, and how hearing God's word through the lips of Jesus Christ, her life was changed. And she went back and told the entire city about the man who told her everything that she had done. And they all came out and they heard Jesus' words. And they said, we were glad to hear what she had to say but we've now heard the words of God and we believe. A prophet is honored when God's word is followed. A prophet is honored when God's word is followed. And in Samaria, it wasn't the signs or the wonders it was the Word of God being spoken to the hearts of the people that really touched their hearts. Today we're going to look at two great healing miracles. And we're going to see that it wasn't quite the same with these miracles, with these signs. We're going to look at the healing of the nobleman's son in John chapter 5. And we're going to look at the healing at the pool of Bethesda in John, excuse me, healing of the nobleman's son, John chapter 4, and the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5. But before we get there, I'd like to tell you a story, a story I found in one of the commentaries. And it kind of sets the, the scene for us, kind of sets the tone, because both of these healing stories kind of follow the same way of approach. A young woman had been very sick. The doctors had only given her about one more year to live. Her family did not attend church regularly, only on Easter and Christmas Eve. And so the young pastor had problems communicating with them at the hospital when he went to visit them and the young woman. After some discussion, the woman finally said, if Jesus healed in the Bible, he should be able to heal me today. And if not, what good is he? So she started to pray, and the pastor started to pray, and the whole family prayed. They prayed, and they pleaded, and they begged, and they bargained. They said, God, if you'll only show mercy, the family will change their ways they'll recommit themselves to you and they'll come to church every Sunday morning. Then, to everyone's amazement, God healed the woman. He healed her completely. And with the physicians wondering what had happened, she left the hospital and went home. The next Sunday, the entire family, dressed in their best clothes, were all seated right in the front row of the church. The woman gave a testimony 
about how wonderful God was to her and how He had shown her mercy and healed her. The next Sunday, the family was there in the front row again. But after a couple weeks, it was only the husband and the woman who was healed. And after a few more weeks, their attendance became irregular. And pretty soon, they were back to their old habits. Easter and Christmas Eve. The woman rationalized the healing. It wasn't really God. It was something else. Something she had done or something the doctors did. Somehow she was healed, but it wasn't really God. Now, she had been healed through prayer surrounded by the church. Some of the most powerful experiences she could have. But after only two months, that power had dwindled to nothing because all she wanted was what she could get out of the situation. Now this is not to say that miraculous signs have no place in the church. They do. We believe it here, that prayer can heal, that prayer can do many things for people. And we see it on a regular basis. In speaking of the healing of the nobleman's son in John 4, E. Schweizer once wrote, the false component here does not consist that he, the royal official, is not interested in Jesus himself, but that he's only interested in something he can obtain through him. We're going to look at two healings. We're going to see what happened in those healings. The first one is the healing of the nobleman's son. And we see a question of faith. A question of faith. And the first thing we see in this passage is that a prophet is without honor. A prophet is without honor. After his time in Samaria, where Jesus' word was honored by the Samaritan people. Jesus continued on his way to Galilee. And he arrived in Galilee in Cana, where he turned the water into wine. And the people in Galilee welcomed him. They were excited to have him there because of the great works and wonders that he'd done, not because of the truth that he spoke. They didn't want to hear his words. They only wanted to see his works. And once Jesus got to Cana of Galilee, we see we have a nobleman, a nobleman with a problem. Starting in verse 46 of John chapter 4, we read, And so he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the official said to him, Sir, come down before my son dies. You see, Jesus had come to Cana where he had performed his first miracle. 
And if you remember that miracle, the only people that knew about it were his mother Mary and the servants that filled the water pots. He didn't make it a big deal. He didn't make it a, a grand show. He just did it. Now the nobleman has come from, from uh, Capernaum. He's heard that Jesus is there. The one who does the great works. The one who does the marvelous signs. And he's come to him to ask him to come down to Capernaum and to heal his son who is sick. He trusted in Jesus' presence. I've got to go there to be with him. Or I've got to bring him to be with me. Jesus had done many signs and wonders in Jerusalem. If he could only bring Jesus to his son, the boy would get well. The official's hope was in Jesus' presence and not in his person. Before we came to Ethiopia, we spent a little bit of time down in Tanzania. And while we were there, there was a man by the name of Babu. Babu in Swahili means grandfather. And many people thought that Babu had the power to heal. And so they would run to Babu to be healed. They would line up in their cars along the road for kilometers just to drive by Babu's house and have Babu dip a little tea in a plastic cup and hand it to them. And if they drank the tea from Babu's hand, all of their sickness would go away. We had some translators that took three days to go to where Babu was just to get a little drink of tea. This man walked 11 miles Twenty kilometers just to see Jesus' presence, just to see if Jesus would come down and bless his son. The lady in the story that we read, all she wanted was what she could get out of it. All she wanted was what she wanted. Many of us put our hope in the presence. We come to church and we hope that God will see us sitting here in the pew. We come to church and we hope that God will smile on us because we've done something good. Nominal Christians. That's not enough just to be in the presence. We see as we go through the story that Jesus made a simple promise. In verse 50 of chapter 4 it says, And Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. And he went on his way. Jesus didn't go with him. Instead, he simply told him to go away. The words here are a dismissal. Go. Your son will live. His son would be alive. We see that the man believed the words about his son. He believed that Jesus would do something in the way of healing his son. 
But still, he didn't believe Jesus. He started to return home. He may have felt disappointed. I would have. I would have felt disappointed. Jesus didn't come with me. I would have felt confused. Did he really mean my son was okay? What's going to happen now? I would have felt lost. But he headed home. And so, with hope that something would happen, the official heads toward Capernaum, not knowing for sure what to believe. And we see that hope turns into a proper faith. A proper faith. Starting in verse 51, we read, And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour. And then he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. And the father knew that was the hour that Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. And he himself believed and his whole household. As the official was going home, walking the 11 miles back to Capernaum, he met some of his servants coming up to Jerusalem. They were coming to tell him that his son had recovered. He'd gotten well. And he asked them. You know, he he expected that the fever would leave Gradually. He didn't know what to believe here. Was, was this something that happened? Was it a rational act? Was it... Uh, is there a rational explanation? Is it a natural recovery? Or did Jesus really do something? So he asked them, uh, about what time? When did my son get well? And they said, Sabbat Sat. Seven o'clock. Which, for those of us that are in a different clock, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. And he realized that that was the exact time Jesus had said, your son will live. And he realized Jesus had healed his son. And with this, the official not only placed his hope in the presence and his trust in Jesus' word, but he placed his faith in the Messiah, the one who was to come, the Christ. Not only he, but his whole family believed. It was after hearing the words of Jesus and experiencing their truth that the man truly had faith. As we look at the second story, the healing at the pool of Bethesda, we see there's a question here of sovereignty. A question of sovereignty. And first we see the place of healing. A place of healing. About five months after the healing of the nobleman's son, there was a a festival in Jerusalem. Probably the Passover. And Jesus went up to be at the festival. And while he was at the festival, he was walking by a pool. This was a special pool. It was near the Sheep Gate on the north side of the temple. It had five covered porches or colonnades. And people would come there 
waiting for the water to be stirred up so they could get in the water and be healed. This is called the Pool of Bethesda, the House of Mercy. Archaeologists have found the pool. They've excavated it. They found the colonnades. And they found evidence that this was used as a healing shrine, a place people would go to for healing. Expecting to be healed. Addis Ababa was started because of hot springs. And people could come to the hot springs and refresh themselves and be healed. There are lots of places around the world where you get into the hot water or you get into the mud or you get into something. You go there and by virtue of the place you're at, there's healing. Or at least that's what people believe. We see that there was a paralytic with a need. In John chapter 5, starting at verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had... Well, let's start at verse 5. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? And the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. When the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps in before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Now the day was the Sabbath. Jesus is walking in the covered areas of the Pool of Bethesda. And there are lots of people there who need healing. And we ask the question, why did he pick this man? Think about it. Out of the multitudes that were there, why did Jesus pick this one man? A better question. Why didn't just Jesus just say the word and heal everybody? Think about it. He had the power, didn't he? Just say the word and everybody's healed. No, he asked the man kind of a silly question. Do you want to be healed? And the man's answer is very revealing. He says, sir, I have nobody to help me. And I can't move fast enough to be the first one into the water. Because while I'm still going down, somebody else beats me. And they get healed ahead of me. He had placed his entire faith on the place that he was at. He had placed his entire faith on a story that he had heard that healing comes from this pool. And Jesus' response to him was very simple. Get up, take your bed, and walk. Now think about it. A man who has been an invalid for 38 years, the muscles in his legs have grown very small and weak. And saying that, Jesus had to heal him. There we go. Jesus had to heal him before he could even stand up. 
And so look at, look at the order. Jesus healed him, then he got up, and then he took up his bed, and he left. And in the meantime, Jesus slipped out amongst the crowd. And the man ran into the Pharisees. He ran into the Jewish official, uh, officials as he was going. And we see they ask him a question, and he gave a simple reply. Starting in verse 10, we read, And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. And they said to him, Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man had been healed, didn't know. For Jesus had withdrawn through the crowd in a place, in the place. And afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. As the man was leaving Bethesda, he ran into some Jews, some Jewish leaders. And they said, this isn't right. It's not by our rules. You can't carry your bed on the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. And the man said, well, the man who had authority to heal me, he showed his authority by healing me, told me to pick up my bed and walk. If he had the authority to heal me, didn't he have the authority to tell me to carry my bed? And the Jew said, who is he? And the man didn't know because Jesus had left. You know, it's curious. Why did Jesus pick this man? And we tie often faith, but this man didn't even know who Jesus was. God has the power to heal whether we have faith or not. If God chooses to heal, he will heal. The leper, Naaman, in the Old Testament, a Syrian, God chose to heal him. He didn't even know who God was. He just followed the instructions of the prophet. Reluctantly. Here the man is healed by Jesus. And he says, the one who had authority to heal told me to carry my bed. And he didn't even know who that one was. So this simple reply brings about a complex problem. Starting in verse 15, we read, And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Let me, let me step back. Because I, I missed that in the first service and I missed it here. Jesus met him in the temple later. And he says, see, you're healed. Now, your life belongs to God. Change your ways. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. Change your ways. Dedicate your life to God. He called the man to follow after, to follow after God. And the man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why Jesus, uh, why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I am working and this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, 
but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The man had been asked. He told the Jews that it was Jesus. Jesus who had told him to take up his bed and walk. And the Jews were persecuting Jesus for breaking the rules, for healing on the Sabbath. Now, the word translated persecution here is often used in a legal context as prosecution. What we do with an offender when we take him to court. The Jews were prosecuting him. They were putting together the charges that they would take him to court on and find him guilty and eventually nail him to the cross. This is the start of Jesus' trial and the charges brought against him. Jesus' response was to make himself equal with the Father. And that made the Jews even madder because no one could be equal with God. So the Jews sought all the more to kill him. We have three people, or three groups of people. First, we have the man who placed his faith in the presence. He wanted to go to Jesus. He wanted to bring Jesus to his son. We do the same thing when we go running after those people who tell us what we want to hear. Say they can heal. God brings healing. Any healing is brought by God, not by a man. We do that when we go to church every Sunday, expecting that it will bring some benefit or some favor with God. The second man placed his faith in participating in an act, in being in a place. We do that too when we add some act or some way of gaining merit with God. The Jews placed their faith in keeping the rules. If you didn't keep the rules, you were wrong. We do that too. We have our rules. Every church has a set of rules. In fact, in this church, there's more than one set of rules. And if you don't follow my rules, you're not a good Christian. No. No. Don't worry about my rules. Worry about God's rules. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the rules that God gave us. Not all of the little do's and don'ts that we make up as we go along. So what are we today? What are we looking for today? A presence that can fulfill our wants and our needs. A system that we can follow to gain merit or favor with God. Are we looking for a set of rules? Are we looking for an experience of true wholeness through the relationship that we can have with the one and only Son of God. The worship team had come back up. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we go running after so many things. We want that which is tangible, which we can touch. We want to hear the words that we want to hear. The words of 
blessing upon us. We want the things that will give us what we want to receive. We want the rules to follow. But Father, you're the one we need to follow. Jesus Christ is the one we need to follow. We need his dear little children to imitate you. Father, help us to get our eyes off from those things which are around us. As the nobleman finally found faith through the words and the power of Jesus, as the man at Bethesda finally found faith in that he was healed and called <coughs> to come to know you and to follow you. May we also give up those things which take us away from you. Father, may we not be busy in the service of the King and in doing so, forget who you are, the true King of glory. We thank you in Jesus' name.